One of my favourites among the Winnie the Pooh stories is the Woozle. If you don't know the Winnie the Pooh stories, then you have a deprived childhood. Um, Piglet finds Winnie the Pooh one day walking around in a circle thinking. And when Piglet asks Pooh what he's doing, his answer is that he's hunting, tracking something. Pooh points to paw marks in the snow. And Piglet excitedly wonders if they might be the tracks of a woozle. Pooh follows the tracks and finds, to his surprise, there are now two sets of tracks and invites Piglet to join him in following them in case the animals are hostile. Pooh and Piglet follow the tracks around a spinny of larch trees and come back around the spinny to the point where they started. But there are now three sets of tracks. Pooh wonders if a whistle has joined the two woozles. Around the spinny they go again, and they now find four sets of tracks. At this point, Piglet has to go, and Christopher Robin appears. Christopher Robin and Pooh have this conversation. Silly old bear, Christopher Robin said. What were you doing? First you went round the spinney twice by yourself and then Piglet ran after you and you went round again together and then you were just going round a fourth time. Wait a minute, said Winnie the Pooh, holding up a paw. He sat down and thought in the most thoughtful way he could think. Then he fitted his paw to one of the tracks and then he scratched his nose twice and stood up. Yes, said Winnie the Pooh. I see now, said Winnie the Pooh. I have been foolish and deluded, said he, and I, and I am a bear of no brain at all. Circular arguments are the bane of scholarship. <laughs> when we deal with questions about the New Testament, it's so easy to go on a woozle hunt. You make an assumption, you follow it round the spinny, and you come back and say, I've supported my assumption. Assuming that Acts is written by a travel companion of Paul can lead to the claim that because it's by a travel companion of Paul, it must be historically reliable. Well, if it's historically reliable, then it makes claims about its author. Oh, it must be Luke, the travel companion of Paul. Or, on the other side... Assume that Acts is written by an anonymous Christian of the first quarter of the second century, and then you say, well, therefore we can't trust the account in Acts at all. And the unreliability of the, account, uh, the accounts is then used to confirm the claim that Acts is late. The question I'm addressing is how far knowing the author of Acts is necessary for good interpretation of the book of Acts. And that's different from the questions that arise in pseudepigraphy in the Pauline letters, for instance, because the question is about a book that is formally anonymous. And I'll say more about that later. Acts is a book, however, where our earliest testimony universally agrees in attributing it to Luke, a companion of Paul, the same author as the third gospel. So my key question in this thought experiment is what difference does it make knowing or not knowing who wrote Acts? And to consider this question, I'm going to review some scholarly discussion of the authorship of Acts, asking why it's studied and what, it, what its implications are. I'm then going to focus on the place of authorship in the discussion of the historical value of Acts with a little bit of consideration of date. Then I'm going to talk about the formal anonymity of Acts, and that will lead to um, considering a selective review of how scholars see authorship in Acts. You may be surprised. We're then going to consider what do we need to interpret Acts well at a global level across the whole book, and I'm then going to close by taking two worked examples. I'm going to look at the Pentecost story and the Philippi story. So, 
let's have a look at some past studies. Why do, does authorship get discussed? The patristic period is really striking because the authorship of the Gospels and Acts is one of the major issues that critical study takes on in the patristic period. And that's partly because of the issue that we've already heard about, that authorship by an apostle or a close associate of an apostle is a factor, but not the only one, in whether a book's recognised as canonical. Canonicity is also linked to whether a book's recognised as divinely inspired, and thus having the authority of God standing behind it. Authorship's also associated in this period um, by, with, with a link to historical reliability, and the trustworthiness of the books. And the authorship of Acts by a companion of Paul was important in this process. There's been debate, of course, over the historical value of Acts. The middle period of the 20th century, roughly the 1920s to the 70s, sees much of the discussion of that historical value um, and particularly the debate about whether it's an accurate portrait of Paul. Now, within those day, those discussions, the place of authorship is really interesting, but not necessarily in the way you might assume. Note Martin de Balius, who believes Luke is Paul's travelling companion, but Acts is entirely historically unreliable. And he holds those two positions together. Ernst Henschen and Hans Konzelmann, two scholarly giants in this period, are not at all precise in their assessments of date, but both regard Acts as late in the first century. Both regard the author as rethinking Christian theology around issues of their day. In Konzelmann's case, famously, the so-called delay of the Parousia. Now, both regard Acts as providing relatively little of historical value, but as reflecting more the churches of their day. By contrast, much English-speaking scholarship takes a different view, notably the American-based Five Volumes Beginnings of Christianity, published from 20, 1920 to 33, and the two British scholars, F.F. F. Bruce and Howard Marshall. Um, Bruce's two commentaries went through various editions. Marshall wrote extensively on Acts, including a very fine short commentary in which he engages Henschen point by point. Both Bruce and Marshall regard the, the author as a sometime travel companion of Luke, uh, of Paul, signalled by the we sections. Both regard Acts as offering a generally trustworthy picture of the events it narrates. Bruce's view of dating interestingly shifted between the first edition of his commentary where he put it in the 60s to the last edition of his commentary where he put it in either the late 70s or early 80s. Now we've noticed already two of the three key, key periods that get spoken about for dating acts, the 60s, the 70s or 80s, and then John O'Neill was one of the first to advocate a second century date, arguing for about 115 to 130. Today, the second century view is slightly more widely represented, um, notably by the work of Richard Purvo, Joe Tyson and Mike Parsons. Purvo and Tyson are clear that the late date goes with historical untrustworthiness. Parsons is rather more cautious because he recognises Luke's commitment to historical verisimilitude and that ancient historians generally did not, I'm quoting Parsons, make stuff up. <laughs> so what, what, we, what we can say concerning date is that those who consider Acts to be a second century product do not think the author can be a travel companion of Paul but that those who think it's from the 60s or 70s um, or 80s can think that, but don't necessarily do so. So it's quite a, a mixed picture. Let's link authorship to date and historical value. Dating and authorship and the theology of the book are interconnected jigsaw puzzle pieces. Um, and they're, they're all important to portraying acts, or indeed any ancient book, 
accurately. And different scholars' assessments of those three things and the interrelationships of those three things can vary, even among scholars who share a view on authorship or share a view on date or ex theological orientation. Now, the so-called we sections are a distinctive feature of this puzzle. As is well known, at several places, the narrative shifts from third person to first person plural. We did this, we went there, and so on. Now, this isn't the place to debate the we passages, but I, I want to note that if you take the view that they rep re represent the author's memory of events or the author's diary of events, then that goes with Acts being a Pauline travel companion. If you take the view that the author's using someone else's diary or he's just using a literary convention to do with sea travel, then you generally take the view that the author isn't a travel companion of Paul. Authorship decisions contribute to, um, a, a, a contribute to an interpretation. So what about the anonymity of Acts? Well, first notice there are a number of Old Testament books which are also anonymous, and not just formally anonymous, they are actually anonymous. Um, Judges, Samuel and Kings are obvious examples. We have no idea who wrote those. They don't give us any clue whatsoever. Um, yet, they're narratives of the life of the people of God, and in that respect, like Acts, and exegetes and preachers appear to experience no problem handling these texts, not knowing who wrote them. Now, there may be plenty of other reasons these books cause, cause, cause difficulties, but their authorship isn't one of them. Ezra and Nehemiah, which is one book in the Hebrew canon, contains sections in both the first person singular and the first person plural. And the source that's being used speaks of himself as being involved in the events being described. And scholars pretty widely agree that those sections reflect memoirs from Ezra and Nehemiah, respectively. In similar manner to the we sections in Acts. Although, interestingly, such me memoirs are unparalleled in the Old Testament, just as the we sections of Acts are unparalleled in the Gospels. And the authorship of the final form of Ezra and Nehemiah, 130 years maybe after the, the last event being described, um, is not an issue that profoundly affects the interpretation of their message. Now the question of authorship is clearly interesting for both the former prophetic books and Ezra and Nehemiah, for those who handle scripture in the academy and the church. But my point is that authorship is not determinative for their interpretation. My learned friend Simon Gathercole, from whom we're going to hear later in the conference, wrote a really fine article on the alleged anonymity of the canonical Gospels. If you've not read it, it's a cracker. Um, and among many cogent and important points, Gathercole observes that it's virtually certain that the author of Luke and Acts was known um, because of the dedication of the book to Theoph the two books to Theophilus. Here, here are the prefaces of the two books where the author addresses the most excellent Theophilus. Now, assuming Theophilus to be an historical individual, which I think in common with my supervisor, Lovedale Alexander, um, and I, I always feel more comfortable if I've got Loveday on my side <laughs> in an argument. <laughs> assuming that Theophilus is, is, is an historical individual, then it is surely impossible that he didn't know who was writing this preface to him. At least somebody knew who the author was. Now, the attachment of the name Luke to Acts and the Third Gospel and the lack of any other suggestion for the author's name in our ancient sources seems to me to be decisive. But does it make any difference um, in interpreting Acts to know that someone called Luke was the author? Incidentally, I've got Richard Borkham and Martin Hengel in my corner on that point as well, so I feel extremely comfortable <laughs> on that point with those three. So why discuss authorship at all? Well, here are four scholars, none of whom could be described as radical de deconstructionists, concerning the lack of impact 
that their authorship, their understanding of authorship has on their interpretation of acts. Howard Marshall, in his Tyndale commentary, identification of the author, date and place of composition of acts does not offer us much help in understanding the book unless we know something independently about each of these factors which can be used to shed light on the book. Fortunately, the intelligibility and value of the book are largely independent of a knowledge of the precise situation in which it was written. While the finer points of the interpretation of Acts can still cause intense discussion among scholars, the essential themes of the book are basically clear and simple. Daryl Bock has a, a one-page discussion of the significance of dating and authorship for the theology of Acts in his book, A Theology of Luke and Acts. Not a single one of his points depends on identifying the author. He makes valid points, but they don't depend on knowing who Luke is. In The New Testament in Its World by Tom Wright and Mike Bird, they have a very good chapter on the New Testament as literature where they explore the roles of author, text and reader in interpreting New Testament texts. And along the way, they quote C.S. Lewis's important caution. An author doesn't necessarily understand the meaning of his own story better than anybody else. That from Lewis. <laughs> they conclude that author, text and reader are all important parts of the communication process. But they're not clear either in that discussion or in their chapter on Luke Acts that precise identification of the author makes a great deal of difference to reading narrative. Then there's Luke Johnson. Johnson is arguably one of the finest Luke Acts scholars of the late 20th century. And in his chapter on Luke Acts, in the writings of the New Testament, he just plainly says, the question of authorship does not in any case greatly help us in interpreting Luke Acts. So what do we need to interpret Acts aright? Well, that really depends on what you mean by interpret. Um, what kind of interpretation are you seeking? For much of the 19th and 20th centuries, mainstream New Testament scholarship thought that interpreting the New Testament meant analysing its sources, discussing its historical value, and perhaps considering the author's redactional contribution, um, and, um, and reconstructing the author's community. That was interpretation. But pastors and lay Christians often found those sorts of atomistic approaches just arid and unhelpful in using scripture to address the situations of faith communities. Happily, we live in better times. The advent of holistic approaches to reading the text in the 1980s and 1990s has given us approaches which facilitate real conversation about the message of the final form of the text. So there are rich and helpful studies of characters and characterization, plot, settings, causation, and much more, which really contribute to helping us understand what's this author <coughs> saying. So to be clear, I'm concerned here with scholarly exegesis and pastoral preaching based on the book of Acts. Um, I'm asking what we need to know to understand the message of the book for Luke's first readers and for Christians engaging with this today. That's the question I'm, I'm focusing on. And I want to suggest there are three features to recognise in the book. First, the last century has, has seen considerable and unusual scholarly consensus that Luke and Acts belong together as the work of one author. So the first thing to recognise is Acts as Volume 2 to Luke's Gospel. Despite of a small number of dissentient voices, that remains the consensus since Henry Cadbury first gave Luke Acts its hyphen. So as many people have recognised, themes run from Luke into Acts, including Luke's fondness for announcement and fulfilment. I prefer that way of describing it to prophecy and fulfilment. Um, that means we can and should construct a picture of the author's concerns and messages from these two books together. And assuming that Luke uses Mark, at least, we can see how Luke handles some of the work of the many who wrote before him. 
The preface to the third gospel applies, I think, to both of the volumes, because Acts announces in 1-1 one, one, that, that the first volume was about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Um, and I, I think Exeter began is no mere Semitic redundancy. Acts is telling the story then of what Jesus continues to do and teach, but now enthroned at the Father's right side and the two books being linked organically by that. Acts is not simply a story about people acting for God, but it's about God and in Jesus acting by the Spirit to carry out God's purposes. And in the preface to Luke, the author's making clear his synthetic aim to draw an account together from his research into written and oral sources that go back to the eyewitnesses, the first believers. That preface also introduces us to a writer who writes good Greek, some of the highest register Greek in the New Testament alongside Hebrews. Sections of Luke and Acts are coloured linguistically and theologically by the author's extensive interaction with the Greek Old Testament. He's writing to present Jesus and the communities of his followers as in continuity with God's purposes in and through Israel in the scriptures. So God's intention to bless the world through the descendants of Abraham is now being carried out through Jesus and his followers who are incorporating others into the people of God. It's not that God had a plan A to bless the world through Israel, a plan that failed, and has now abandoned that in favour of plan B, working directly with the Gentiles because of Israel's failure. Rather, because Israel is now being restored, the tent of David's been rebuilt. The time is right in the purposes of God for the Gentiles to join God's people. So recognise Acts as volume 2 to Luke. Secondly, recognise the historical and theological claims Acts makes. Bart Ehrman is not usually seen as a friend of evangelical scholarship. Um, although at one point relevant here, I think he's absolutely spot on. The point is that Ehrman considers that the we sections claim that the author was present when the events took place. Now, Ehrman thinks Luke is lying, and at that point he and I part company. But I think he's absolutely spot on in thinking that. The we sections are most naturally understood as denoting the author's presence. And it's striking that these sections are some of the most detailed in Acts, including, for instance, the account of the storm and shipwreck, in Acts 27, which is one of the fullest and most detailed accounts of a shipwreck we have in antiquity. Um, our author is present in similar manner to Ezra and Nehemiah at some events in their book. Of course, eyewitnesses have their own perspective on things, and we need to see these we events through our author's eyes. So we, we need to treat them with the seriousness with which any eyewitness account is treated, in antiquity or today. Our author doesn't only claim his own eyewitness testimony. The apostles are ear and eyewitnesses of Jesus. That's the criterion for replacing Judas in Acts chapter 1. Their speaking ministry is central to the lives of the early believers in Jerusalem, both in evangelism and teaching. The apostles' teachings at the heart of what they do. When um, the, the seven are appointed, the apostles say, we must not give up serving the word. Harnack is the first I found who suggests that Acts source for the Philip stories is the wee character's encounter with Philip and his family in Caesarea some years later. Just picture the scene. Here's the wee character having dinner with Philip and his prophesying daughters. And, and he says to Philip, they prophesy, you know, and they just roll their eyes at their father at that point. <laughs> and, and then Philip says, says, looks across the table and says, have I told you? And the girls just say, oh, Dad, not the missionary stories again. <laughs> but I think Harnack's right, that that was the scenario that happened, that, that that's how they got the stories. And the naming of Philip identifies, I think, the source of the story just as Borkham has argued for stories in the Gospels. You get a named source. The author himself claims to draw on the testimony of those who, from the beginning who were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. 
Eyewitness testimony is crucial to Acts in similar manner to the third gospel, I suggest. And there's a doctoral thesis to be written applying Balkan's eyewitness approach to the book of Acts. Um, please persuade someone to do it. Um, the central theological claim of Acts alongside this is that Jesus is to be worshipped alongside the Father and that this God is directing the believing community's mission to the world. I've argued elsewhere for the centrality of God to the narrative of Acts and thus for the importance of asking over and over again what is God doing in this story individually or the big story of Acts? Matthew Sleeman and Max Turner add to this. Sleeman identifies the importance of a geographical orientation to Acts, which includes the heavenly dimension. Jesus is no absentee in Acts. He's not, it's not that the Holy Spirit plays Superman to Jesus Clark Kent. But Jesus is active within the narrative and the events which go on, but he's now active from heaven. Turner highlights the significance of Acts 2.33, Speaking about Jesus, being exalted therefore at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he's poured out this that you both see and hear. Peter speaks of Jesus being exalted to God's right side, Jesus receiving the Spirit from the Father and Jesus pouring out the Spirit. The significance of that is that the, in Second Temple Judaism there is one and only one who pours out the Spirit, and that's Yahweh himself. This is hugely Christologically important. Turner therefore argues for a Christological Big Bang at Pentecost, as the disciples' understanding of Jesus changes because of their experience of the Spirit, rather than a gradual evolution of Christology. So putting this together... The shape of Acts' theological understanding can, I think, can appropriately be called implicitly Trinitarian. And I'm interested that Patrick Schreiner has talked about a Trinitarian theology of Acts recently. It provides the raw materials that later believers will develop with the writings of Paul and John into a full-blown doctrine of the Trinity. And I think it's not only legitimate but necessary to read Acts through a divinely orientated lens because that's the lens the author hands to us. Thirdly, we need to pay attention, we need to recognise the story Acts tells us. I mentioned the contribution earlier that holistic approaches such as narrative criticism have made to reading um, Acts and the Third Gospel. Scholars such as Luke Johnson, Bob Tannehill, Beverly Gaventer, Joel Green, and most recently David Bauer have helped us to read Acts using that tool set. And it's important to notice that good narrative criticism is not ahistorical, but engages with the social, cultural, geographical and historical settings of the stories it reads. If not, you end up treating acts like Alice in Wonderland, a place where weird stuff happens, but it's a place we do not and could not inhabit. So let's ask what question Acts is answering. At one level, Acts is narrating um, how, a uh, how a Jewish sect um, centred on Jesus, a Galilean prophet, became a worldwide movement worshipping the exalted Jesus. In other words, a central thread in Acts is that God drives the believing communities to embrace Gentiles. So when we read stories in Acts, we should ask where in the overall narrative of the book that story is located Otherwise, we might misinterpret it by failing to recognise how it contributes to the narrative's overall direction. Let's look at two examples. Pentecost is the Jewish um, harvest festival, and it can plausibly be associated with the giving of the law. Um, Deuteronomy 16 counts off seven weeks from the beginning of the harvest to the Feast of Weeks, to Pentecost and connects that in Deuteronomy 16.12 with remember that you are slaves in Egypt and follow carefully these decrees. So it connects it. And a calculation based on Exodus 19.1, they come to the wilderness of Sinai on the third new moon. That's 28, it's 56 days. 
two new moons. Um, and, and so you're, you're hitting around the same 50-day period. There are mosaic echoes in the Pentecost account, and those links place the Spirit functionally in the place of the Torah within the new community. The renewed Israel is gathered around the Spirit in the way that the, the Israel after the flesh is gathered around the Torah. Now Paul's going to develop that point. Um, and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, of course, look forward to the day when God's people are, are going to be enabled to live God's way by the Spirit's enabling. Jewish believers, of course, aren't required to give up Torah observance, but the Torah's role is relativised because Gentiles are being admitted to the community as Gentiles without requiring circumcision for men and Torah observation for all. Looking forwards... Pentecost also prepares for the Spirit's coming on others, on groups of Gentiles and God-fearers. The Spirit's coming on Cornelius' household shows that they are to be included in God's people. Peter's clinching arguments is to say, how can we withhold baptism from them? Because they've received the Spirit. Um, Peter, in, in Jerusalem, in chapter 11, says to the circumcision group that these people have received the same gift which we ourselves received, clearly alluding back to Pentecost. And that argument's decisive. Peter's testimony about those events in chapter 15 is one of the key features in the, the, the resolution of the debate in Jerusalem. And it's full of language about God acting. This Gentile Pentecost is patterned on Acts 2, because like Pentecost, it features the Spirit's sudden coming with tongue speech. What about Peter's speech in Acts 2? Well, you can read it aloud in about five minutes. And that brevity shows that it's not a verbatim account and is clearly not meant to be. The character of the speeches in Acts is much debated in scholarship. There's a spectrum of views from those who say they're entirely the author's creation to those who see them as based on historical tradition. On the whole, I'm at the historical tradition end of the spectrum, while recognising that the themes and the languages that run across the speeches um, echo each other and suggest at least some authorial shaping of the material. But that considerable consistency across themes, noticed long ago by C.H. Dodd, also implies there's a solid core of Christian proclamation, um, which Acts advocates implicitly should be core to its, its believer, the believers of its day. Acts frequently gives you a full account of a speech and then leaves us to understand that in similar places, similar things were said. 14.1 makes this explicit. The same stuff happened in Iconium, I'm paraphrasing, um, as happened in Pisidian Antioch. What of the events that take place? Well, some express doubts about the plausibility of the speech to such a large, cr large crowd, at least 3,000, according to 241, and of such a large number of being baptised. If we consider the author's drawing on eyewitness testimony, perhaps gathered in the period when the wee character's in Palestine for two years, while Paul's in prison in Caesarea Maritima, then we, we can reconsider, I think. During festivals, the population of Jerusalem swelled um, and the Temple Mound could physically hold as many as 400,000 people. Um, Ed Sanders calculates that on the basis of the size of the sacred mosque in Mecca, which holds half a million people. And the, um, it's only 7% larger than the Jerusalem Temple Mount. So I think he's, he's got reasonable grounds. The city would be packed and a large gathering is highly plausible. Those of you who've been to Ephesus will know there's a massive theatre there that holds 20,000 people. But that implies they could all hear when the actors spoke on the stage. Or in the modern world, George Whitfield, John Wesley and others spoke to large outdoor crowds. Ben Franklin calculates in his, in, in his autobiography that um, Whitfield could be heard by 30,000 people. And he's a near contemporary of, of Whitfield. 
As for baptism, the, the mikvot baths around the temple, which were used for ceremonial washing for those coming to the temple, would provide an obvious place for baptising. They'd certainly be more, more than adequate if baptism was by pouring water over the candidates, as Howard Marshall argues. Now, here's my point. None of these things depend on knowing who wrote Acts. The important questions for interpreting this story are nothing to do with the author. They depend on a careful reading of the text in the light of the author's known interest in scripture's realisation in the events of the earliest believing communities. And they acquire greater plausibility if we take seriously a role for eyewitness testimony in the account of Acts. The author and his views and methods and sources is far from irrelevant. But knowing his name is not terribly important. Philippi. This section begins with one of the most puzzling sequences of events in Acts, where the Spirit uniquely prevents mission from happening in particular areas. And Acts tells us nothing of the means by which the Spirit does this. The group's bafflement is partly undone by Paul's ninth vision of the man of Macedonia. Um, some of the commentaries get terribly excited about this and say, how did they know he was from Macedonia? Well, I think the fact that he was saying, come over to Macedonia, is a clue. <laughs> <laughs> um, but notably here, there's a switch from third person to first person plural in the story. We decided that God had called us in verse 10. And that implies we're dealing with eyewitness testimony from Troas onwards. And once in Philippi, the we character gives us some fascinating detail about the city, that it's a Roman colony, about Lydia. Um, details of no theological or symbolic significance like Lydia's home city and trade read like eyewitness testimony. And interestingly, she's named, but the jailer later in the story is not. We'll come to why. The slave girl who tells fortunes offers another vignette. Although she's not named, we learn a lot about her. In particular, she's got a python spirit, a pneuma puthona, which is an echo of the Delphic Oracle, because a python guarded the oracle until Apollo killed it. Henshin considers this story to be derived from eyewitness testimony, but he claims that the charges against Paul don't match his deeds, because he's charged with advocating Jewish practices rather than charged with exorcism. And Henshin says, well, that wouldn't happen anyway, because nobody would be indicted for exorcism. I wonder if Henshin has ever heard of Jesus. Now, the significance of what the slave girl says is debated. When heard in a first century Greco-Roman setting in Philippi, her words are deeply ambiguous and would appear to be so to Greco-Roman hearers of Acts. She calls Paul and Silas douloi, slaves, similar to her status as Pidiske, slave girl, who serves lords, kurioi. She identifies Paul and Silas as God, as hotheos hohupsistos, the most high God. Now, Zeus was sometimes called Zeus Hupsistos, Zeus the Most High, and Theos Hupsistos, Most High God. And he could be identified with the high god of a local cult. Um, we've got evidence from Syria, Lydia, and Egypt of that going on. She claims that Paul and Silas announce Hodos Soterias, a way of salvation. And I'm translating it that way because Acts describes the believing community as ho-hodos. Actually, it's hey-hodos, isn't it? The way. Um, but this is inarticular. A way of salvation. And soteria is a very broad term for salvation of all kinds in antiquity. Paul Trabilco notes its use in inscriptions to theos upsistos and as the object of vows. Paul's silencing of the demon's announcements through the girl's stem, I'm inclined to think, from these ambiguities, because Paul and Silas could be misunderstood badly because of these ambiguities. <laughs>
at this point, economic interests kick in and Paul and Silas are arrested on the pretext of announcing Jewish practices, which is a bit ironic because they are. And the magistrates order lictors to beat Paul and Silas with rods, which is the usual way you extract information from non-Romans. And the remarkable earthquake that results results in them le leading, to, leading the jailer to faith and then facing the magistrates next day who are ready to get rid of them. But by now, the narrative has slipped into third person. And that's why the jailer is not named. The, the, the we character does not meet the jailer. The puzzle now, the, in fact, the we character doesn't travel on to Thessalonica in 17.1. So he either goes somewhere else or he stays in Philippi when Paul and Silas leave. The puzzle now is why Paul and Silas hold off declaring their Roman citizenship. Um, and Rapsky's got a helpful discussion suggesting three things. If, if they declared their citizenship earlier, that would have precipitated a Roman trial and would have put financial pressure on them and forced them to stay. Secondly, um, Paul and Silas's status as Jews is being held against them. The accusers say, we're Romans, we can't do Jewish practices. So if Paul and Silas declare their Roman citizenship, it damages their credibility as Jews. And remember that Christianity is not separate from Judaism at this time. And it would confuse those with whom they shared the gospel. Thirdly, Rapsky says, if they declare their Roman citizenship earlier, then they'd leave non-Roman believers exposed because they had no such protection in law available to them. And it would mean that only Romans could safely become followers of Jesus. And that would make Paul and Silas's call to suffer for the gospel, which is in Philippians, somewhat hypocritical. So as with Pentecost, we notice that the identity of the author doesn't help with the most significant questions in the passage. A wee passage of all kinds of passages where I propose the author's present for much of what happens. The author's a significant presence in this story, but his precise identity is neither necessary nor important for understanding the story. So where does this leave us? What am I advocating? I'm advocating not getting too worried about the authorship of Acts. I'm not advocating not debating it. I am, I am writing a commentary, and I shall do so. <laughs> Um, but we can recognise information about the author which we can infer from Acts, which helps us interpret the story. He's present for some of the events as the weak character. It's highly likely he's drawing on other eyewitness testimony in Acts, sometimes naming his sources, like, um, like Rhoda, I, I think, um, the maid, um, and like Philip. He's rather clear about his central themes and emphases, and uses them to call his hearers to respond to God as faithful witnesses in their time and place. Now those are features that can help us in reading and interpreting Acts for both the academy and the church. And they encourage us that we can read it in the confidence that the book's message has much to say to our time and place too. Thank you. I will put these slides up before I go to bed tonight on my blog, if you'd like them. Steve, thank you for an absolutely splendid paper. Those of you who are uh, clock watchers, we are inheriting the sins of languishing over our coffee earlier. But we also don't have uh, anyone kicking us out of the building right at nine. And so Emma will give us a little grace. So uh, if we have time for a few questions, then we'll have uh, TJ's paper next and we'll be done when we're done. The shuttle won't leave until the papers are done. But first, a few questions for uh, Steve. Simon. Steve, thanks for seeing the paper. Okay. Um, I mean, is, is the verdict on the relationship between author and interpretation in this case basically because all we know about the author is in the text anyway? Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it, so, so is that is that basically true for for any text where we're we're in a similar situation in comparison with something like 
I know Caesar's Gallic Wars, where we know a lot about the author, uh, mm. a lot about the author outside of the text. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, essentially. I mean, uh, that's our difficulty. Yeah. Um, my friends who work on the Pauline letters get very twitchy about the possibility of using acts to help them know about Paul. And I think they're wrong to get twitchy. And I suspect you think that too. Um, um, because we have got other information if we're prepared to listen to Luke. Um, I'm calling him Luke now rather than the author because um, everybody does call him Luke. But yeah, I mean, I, I think it's the lack of external information that's the problem in dealing with a text that is formally, but only formally, anonymous. Yeah. Have you, have you got further thoughts on that? I mean, you no, thought, I, you thought about this in relation to the Gospels. No, I, 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 I agree. I think it's, 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 it's not, yeah, it's not something particular about acts, is it? It's something, something that's generally no. true of, 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 of texts that yeah. are, Difficult to date precisely, yeah. and we don't know about the author. Yeah, and what, Joseph Josephus' antiquities. We know lots about Josephus, partly because he's told us himself, and that means we can pick up the colour and the direction from it pretty easily. I think. Yeah. We probably have time for two more questions. Yeah, on um, the dating of. Uh, the book of Acts, I assumed that you were going earlier than later uh, in uh, response. Uh, does the uh, lack of the death of Paul in 28 uh, say anything about the timing of mm. when the book was written? Um, Carl Armstrong's recently published a book on the dating of Acts, arguing that it's dated in 62. And his critical argument is that explains the ending of the book. And it seems to me that's the strongest argument for an early date. The lack of reference to the fire of Rome, I think, is also relevant. Because the fire of Rome is a devastating event and must have had a huge impact on Christians in the city. And the fact that there's not even a hint of it, th those, I think, are Armstrong's two strongest arguments. Yeah. Is, uh, this, is it Armstrong that makes the connection to most excellent being in a legal context? I can't remember. Uh, recently I heard someone, I think here at Lanier, uh, last month suggest possibly Acts was a defense and that Theophilus is uh, somehow connected to the Roman court. And he just cites that that term is unusual and occurs only in legal context. Gratistus. Yeah. Um, I'd love to get your opinion on that later. Yeah. After you uh, research. Gratistus is just a, uh, it's, a mo it's most excellent. And we get two people called Gratistus in the two governors in, that, in, in the latter right. part of Acts. Okay. Um, and, and I've often wondered to myself whether these were pre presented to to Theophilus as models of how not to be a Kratistos mm. because they don't act honourably. Mm. But it's the equivalent, it's probably about the equivalent of a, a sir in British society. Mm. So I don't think it's specifically a legal term. Simon, can you think of an example? I'm, yeah, I'm appealing I'm, to Simon because he's a classicist. No, I've this once and it, it's basically used um, of, of any high official. Um, but it can be, it can be you know, someone can address their literary... Well, there are other examples of people dedicating works to yes. someone who's practiced mm. um, So, it's, yeah, it's not... It's not mm. I needed yeah. you last month because it caught me completely last <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. All right. All right. Well, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.